we're now at the point where we can go and write a very simple executable program. Let's start with a hello world. Okay, so we're going to create a file that prints out hello world. Okay, so we're going to do echo, echo hello world. We, ha we used single quotes over here. Single quotes will really print out exactly what's inside here. We want to print echo double quotes hello world into the file hello by redirecting it. So this is going to create this file called hello, which is going to have echo hello world inside of it. Now let's try to execute the file. We do dot slash hello. We'll try to execute the file. But there is a problem because the file is by default not executable, and therefore we will get a, um, an error. So we're going to need to make it executable, and we'll do chmod u plus x hello. It will make it executable, and now we can run dot slash hello, and it will print out hello world as we expected. But how do we actually tell it to use bash and not something else to run our program? Well, one way is to write source hello. If we run source and it doesn't need to be executable, then by the way, it will inter it will go line by line and take it and put it into the interpreter, which is right now the bash shell. But we can actually explicitly tell it to run bash when we do something like dot slash hello. And the way to do it is to add what we call a shebang. So we'll first use um, one of our text editors. I like vi, so we'll do vim hello. When we get into vi, and this is going to confuse you a bit if you don't know vi, but believe me, you learn about it at some point. You press i, it turns vi into what we call insert mode, where we can actually go and edit the text. Then we can type something like this, pound sign, bang, and that's called a shebang. And then we give the uh, path of the executable of bash, which is the, the interpreter we want to use. So slash bin slash bash. And then we write um, whatever we wanted to write, echo, hello, or whatever else. Okay. Then we do escape. That will um, exit insert mode. And we do uh, colon WQ or colon X to save and exit. And now we have our, um, uh, our program, which is a bash file. So oh, let's do the example that I showed. So I'm going to do echo, um, uh, echo, hello, world, um, and I'm going to redirect that to uh, to my file called hello. And now I'm going to try to execute that. So I'm going to do dot slash hello, and it says that permission is denied. And the reason that permission is denied is because when I look at that file, I see that I do not have execute permissions to it. So I'm going to do chmod um, u, uh, u plus x on hello. And then if I, again, do ls minus l hello, I see that now I have execute permissions on it. And then I can do dot slash hello. And voila, it uh, echoed hello world to me, which is what I wanted it to do. So that was really cool. Okay. Um, now, uh, I want to actually tell it to use bash. So what I can do is vim hello. And uh, in vim, now what I can do is I can go to insert. I'll add a new line over here. And I'll do a shebang and then slash bin slash bash. And that will make it executable always using bash. Okay. Um, so uh, really now what I'm going to do is I'm going to write hello. And uh, it, well, sorry, dot slash hello. And that will do it. So um, another thing is that I could do is I could source the file. Okay. And um, that means that it will read right line by line and run it. So sourcing hello does the same uh, thing basically as executing it, but always with the, uh, the uh, shell that I'm using. So it would always be running it with bash. So now I'm going to go over into variables in bash. So a shell, like any other programming language, has variables, and they can be very useful. And we saw that before with the environment variables. Um, for bash, it's really easy. We just write var equals value. So foo equals bar will create a variable called foo that um, its value is bar. Okay, And this is a local variable. It's only available right now in the terminal that we're using in the shell that we're using. So um, now we have this, this thing with quotations, and you saw that I used it before. Sometimes I use double quotations and sometimes single quotations. When we use double quotations, it will actually dereference whatever variables I have. So if I use echo double quotations, dollar sign, foo, it will return bar. But if I use a single quotation, it will not dereference this dollar sign. So it will actually return dollar sign foo. So I do echo dollar foo. 
and I see that uh, it returns nothing, but then I do foo equals bar. And now if I again do echo dollar foo, foo returns bar. So that's really cool. But what if I was to do echo um, uh, uh, double quotes foo? Well, I see it again returns bar, and that's really nice because I can do something like echo, uh, you know, foo, dollar foo will return foo bar. Okay, but what happens if I do echo um, foo, dollar foo? Then what it's going to do, it's going to return foo, dollar foo. So it will only dereference the dollar sign when it's inside double quotes and not, in, not inside single quotes. And as I said, variables are local to the shell. And that is for that reason, if I start a program for my shell, it won't know about the variable that I started. Let's say path or home or anything like that will not be known to my shell if it's a local variable. So that's why we have what we call environment variables. And those environment variables are known to any program that I open from within uh, the shell. And then it can access those variables. It can make things very, very good. We can configure things by putting them in environment variables and then opening a program, and the program will be able to access those uh, settings that I set. So how can we see a list of these environment variables? We write env, and env is again going to be a long list, so we can pipe it into more or less or vi or any of these different types of text editors that we have. Um, to define a new environment variable, we don't use the same foo equals bar. We use export. In fact, if we write export foo, it will uh, turn foo into an environment variable. But if we directly want to um, create an environment variable, um, we use export. So export charlie equals brown. Now charlie will be an environment variable, and we will see it when we print env, or our uh, program that we will start will now be able to access the variable called charlie. So remember, again, that I had these special variables that are environment variables, such as echo dollar $path okay and uh, or echo dollar home these were um, environment variables and uh, if i want to see all of the environment variables what i'll do is i'll write env and we see that there are a lot of environment variables and therefore what i will do is i will pipe it into less and now i can look through the variables and for instance i can look for home okay so i see that home appears in many different places over here there are ways to find the exact home i want but as you see here, home equals data, home, team, and AD. And there are a lot of other things that are environment variables over here. Um, what would happen if I wanted to create an environment variable? I would use the export command. So again, I can do something like export charlie equals brown. And uh, now let's again do env piped into less. And now let's look for charlie. And voila, we have charlie equals brown as an environment variable. Or I can do echo. Um, dollar charlie and you see that i get brown so that's uh, how i make an environment variable and dereference it so let, now we're ready to actually go and make a whole script so um, really bash can be used to uh, control all kinds of uh, programs and so forth and so on it gets very useful to make all kinds of batch commands that are run and, and do all kinds of processes. So therefore, we have ifs and cases and whiles and fors and all kinds of other things, just like other programming languages. We don't usually program deep in uh, dirty things inside Bash. We'll use real programming languages for that. But we'll use it to start up programs and um, run control flow. Um, so we can also have, with the scripts that we write, we can pass arguments to them. So there are these special things that we pass. Dollar zero is the name of the script. So if uh, my script before was called hello, if I ask for dollar zero, it will uh, return the name of it, which is hello, the name of the file actually. Dollar one to dollar nine are the arguments that I can put after the name of the uh, of the file. Um, dollar at is all of the arguments, so it's a list of all of the arguments that I provided. Dollar um, pound is going to be the number of arguments, and Dollar um, question mark is the exit status of the previous command. So let's see this very complicated script over here, what, uh, what it does. So first of all, I use the shebang bin bash. So that means it's going to be a uh, bash script, and it's going to be run with the bash interpreter. The first line is going to um, have an echo. So it's going to print something on the screen. What is it going to print? It's going to print running program something with something arguments. What is this something? We cite the name of the script. So let's say. The script was called um, hello, so it's going to say running program hello, and let's say that uh, it was hello argument one, argument two, so it's going to say it has 
number of arguments, so two arguments. So it was going to say running program, hello, with two arguments. Then the next one is a, a four. It's actually like a four each. And we provided this dollar at, which is all the arguments. So it's a list of the arguments. And remember, our arguments were argument one and argument two. So we got a list, argument one and argument two. When we do for file in this list of argument one, argument two, do. So the first time, the first iteration, file is going to equal argument one. So it's going to do a grep. So it's going to look for the string foobar inside argument one. Okay. And then it's going to do this weird thing over here. Well, this weird thing over here, it, it, it says what it is. First of all, um, if the pattern is not found, grep has exit status one. So if grep succeeds, then exit status is going to be zero. If grep doesn't succeed, exit status is going to be one. And as we saw here, there's a special variable called dollar question mark, which is the exit status. So we know that exit status is going to be one if the grep was not found if we did not find foobar in fi inside the file called argument one. Okay, then what is it doing? It's redirecting the output to a null register. That just means don't show the output on the screen, don't do anything with it, just throw it away. And to um, redirect means what, what do I do with the errors? So if there is an error, then also throw it to this null register. It means don't do anything with it. So it says that over here. Redirect standard output and standard error to a null register. It just means don't print anything when you do these greps. Just throw them away, but do keep the exit status of the previous one inside this uh, dollar sign um, question mark. Okay, so now we can use an if. We do if dollar sign question mark minus ne zero. That means if the exit status was not equal to zero, i.e. it is equal to one, that means we had an empty grep grep did not find any foobar inside the file, then what are we going to do? We're going to add foobar to the file, and then it's going to echo, uh, write this, append it to the file. When it finishes the iteration, that first of all, the fi finishes the if. Um, when it finishes the iteration, it goes back over here. It'll put argument two in the file. Again, it will see if foobar is inside the file. If it's not inside the file, it will add it to the file. And then finally, it will finish and exit. So that is a kind of a complex type of a weird script that doesn't do much. Uh, but it's just an example of what you should be able to kind of understand and follow along. What if we want to call a script in an, uh, another language? What if we want to write a Python file, for example? We want to print hello world in Python syntax. Well, then if we do this shebang bin bash, it will try to interpret it with the bash interpreter and it won't understand it. We have to tell it to interpret it with Python. So we do shebang bin Python, and then it will go and it will use Python to interpret it. Um, make sure that Python is actually installed in bin Python, or maybe you have a different version that is installed somewhere else, and you want to put that in your shebang. So um, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to open up my hello program, and as we saw here, we have this uh, shebang slash bin slash bash. Okay, but what happens if I replaced my, uh, my, my command to be in a different programming language, let's say like in Python. So um, here I'll write hello world in Python. Um, and uh, let's see what's going to happen now. So um, when I now go and I do dot slash hello, um, it's going to say that there's a syntax error. And the reason there's a syntax error is because it's trying to um, interpret this as a bash program. If I do source hello, the same thing will happen. Okay. So let's reopen hello and change my uh, shebang. So instead of pointing at bash, it will actually point at Python. Okay, so um, now I'm going to, uh, I can also look and see that there's a slash bin slash Python. Okay, I see it's there. I could have written which Python. Okay, and I see that there is uh, such a program as Python. So um, now that I changed uh, that to uh, Python again, uh, remember, I changed the shebang. So now uh, it's supposed to run as a Python program and not as a bash program. So now when I do dot slash hello, it is going to actually print hello world uh, as I asked it to. Um, if I source it, it still will not work. Okay. Um, it will again try to run it as a bash programs, but it is not a bash program. So um, that will not work. But when I run it as an executable, it indeed uh, thinks it's a Python program and interprets it as a Python program.
So what else do we want to do with our command line? Well, we often want to compress and uncompress files. And the basic thing that is provided with most distros is the zip command. So if we do zip myfile.zip, that's going to be the name of our archive, add these files, myfile.txt to it, it's going to zip myfile.txt and put it in a file called myfile.zip. And of course, we can uncompress it then by going unzip myfile.zip. Now, each of these commands, they have man pages and many, many options. And actually, the Linux distros will usually have different uh, uh, programs like gzip and uh, gunzip to um, zip files. But this is the basic, real basic one. Okay. What we do often, and you'll hear this, um, this terminology a lot, is to tar things or provide a tarball. So when we want to transfer a whole bunch of files in a whole directory structure, we usually use a um, command called tar. And uh, that's a tape archive. We used to archive a whole thing and put it on a tape, and that's where it got its name. So tar with these options, which I guess you just remember by heart, minus czvf, that will um, create a compressed archive of the whole directory that we tell it to. So the name of the archive, we usually end it by .tar.gz to show it was, um, it was archived with tar and then zipped, okay? And then we tell it uh, whatever the directory is, and it will take all the directory and recursively go and take all of the things that are under the directory. And when we untar it, and that we do with tar minus xzvf, it will be untarred with the whole structure of the directory. So um, I can zip a file. So remember, if I had um, in my uh, directory, I had this files list, which was 1.6 uh, megabytes. I can, by the way, do ls minus lh, um, and then see that it's actually 1.6 megabytes. So um, what I can do now is I can compress that by writing um, zip, uh, and let's put it on the desktop, okay, uh, my files dot zip, uh, and we're going to add to that files list, okay? So what it's going to do, it's going to, uh, it says it deflated it by 92%. So let's do ls minus lh on now the desktop, and we see that myfiles.zip is only 127 kilobytes. So that really did a nice compression. Okay, and then I can actually unzip that. So I can, let's um, CD over to the desktop and unzip myfiles.zip. Uh, my and what I see is that now I have a files list, which is unzipped and myfiles.zip, which is not unzipped. The reason I went and changed my directory into desktop because otherwise it would have unzipped it um, on my uh, home directory where I already have this files list um, uh, files list file. So I'm going to go back onto my home directory, and now I'm going to show you that I can tarball that whole desktop directory, for example. So tar minus czvf, and then I will call it something like my desktop um, dot tar dot gz. And uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put desktop inside of that, and there it's going to you see it told us that it tarred all of these files into there. And what I get is I have this tarball now um, called mydesktop.tar.gz, and that's its size. I can uh, put that with uh, human readable, and I see that it is 250 kilobytes, even though we saw that there's a 1.6 megabyte file inside of that, um, as we saw before, but it really uh, made it nice. Okay, um, now let's go into, uh, let's make a directory called temp. Okay, cd into temp, and then let's untar um, that, uh, that tarball that we had. So tar minus xzvf, and I'm going to go and get uh, my desktop tar.gz, and it's going to put it in here. So now what do I have here? I have a, a directory called desktop, which is what I tarred, and uh, I can look at the directory, um, right, and see what it has inside. Uh, it has, you know, my files and files list and so forth. So that's a really convenient way of tarring things and untarring.